You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities, um, where we are still in the book of Samuel. Emily and I are, are doing a, uh, still doing our distance learning, as I've been calling it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've been enjoying it. So i got some really uh, fun news, actually. I got an early Father's Day present. Whoops, bumped my mic. I got some nice monitors <laughs> back there for editing, um, which are great. Yeah. And... After uh, ac- actually, after we're done recording today, I'm gonna go pick up lumber to build a custom desk out of that. So we'll have that. Sweet. Hopefully, that'll be in our next batch of recordings. Um, so, well, and then hopefully you can get up here and we can use it because I've got it. I've got yeah. the design in mind <laughs> with um, with the idea that we can it'll be you know functional for the podcast when we're both in the same room. So hopefully you mean no that'll... more TV trays. Uh, yeah, we're going to get rid of the TV trays. So that's super exciting news about our very professional operation we have here. <laughs> Despite <laughs> not small beginnings. And no, so, yeah, I, no, I, I've been having a great time. I, I was surprised to 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 get those, um, you know, so it's a uh... well, I just Go ahead. I just kind of chalk up. The way we started everything with we took what we had to work with and we're making the best use of it possible. Absolutely. And so, you know, TV trays, it doesn't hinder what we're having to say. And, you know, we'll just get a little better, a little bit more professional as we go along. Well, yeah. until then, you know. Yeah. I mean, people seem to like us. Well, the, uh, the, the focus here <laughs> is the content and. Um, right. Obviously not the production value. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, not to pat us too much on the back. I mean, you you have made sure that we we've got good sound quality and that things do look pretty good. Because I mean, there's a lot of fly by night podcast out there, so well, I'm I'm actually pleased with our the way we have managed to present the stuff. Well, and make yeah. it more engaging. Well, and I and actually speaking of that, I do want to make a note. Last week's episode, um, your audio was a little bit off, um, because. Uh, somehow it didn't record on your end, so I actually wound up having to use the audio off of your video feed, um, so it might sound a little oh, rougher, no. and also by the time I had Oops. to go through all that, I did not do a whole lot of editing because I was already <laughs> behind schedule, and I had a bunch of stuff I needed to get done with my family, so... Well, um, that's me just learning technology. You know better. Well, yeah, it happens, <laughs> so yeah, just keep an eye on that uh, on that recorder. Make sure it's it's going, so... Everything's it, looking good, all so... Right, perfect. <laughs> Well, cool. So as I mentioned, so I, that's just like some kind of minor notes. So um, yeah, you might see some things changing here on the YouTube feed if you are interested in that. And uh, if you like my desk and you're doing your own podcast, let me know. We can maybe talk about uh, how to monetize your uh, podcast by selling equipment. By there selling you go. equipment. Yes. <laughs> what, who, who was it? Who launched? Was that, was that a Babylon Bee article? I, you know, I saw it. I shared it in one of the podcast groups I'm in. I honestly don't remember what the source was. It just cracked me up because most of us are hoping to make a little bit of money to to kind of cover our expenses because there are expenses. Yeah. But well, uh, and I, I do have to say I do appreciate everyone who has been giving, and I apologize again for not having extra seriously? Patreon content. We're getting there, uh, but we've had some some great donors. Uh, I was getting ready to say during I the do middle. Appreciate. I'm not going to name anyone because I don't want to embarrass anyone. I don't, you know, if you if you don't want your friends or to forget know you're anyone. To this show, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much but, and yeah uh, during this time uh, we we have had so many people who have supported us and you know of all the times to to just give this is not one that i would think of as being you know uh convincing for people to do or you know even be convenient so i have just been blown away at yeah. the people who are who are just being so supportive and so i you know, I love them, and the the paddle store, the group we've got in there. I mean, we're having some great conversations, and oh yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm getting ready to on one of our very near future episodes. They actually helped write that, so you know, it, it's making it a lot of fun for me to even do this. So 
we we do i mean everybody who has just been so generous it's amazing it's humbling and at the same time it's just really really exciting because it means we get to do it more so yeah, absolutely anyway <laughs> so that's that's some kind of updates on what we've got going on um but yeah let's uh as I said, we're still in the book of Samuel. I think we're finishing 15, starting 16. Is that correct? Yeah, we'll see how far we get with 15 even. Uh, yeah, Samuel, the, the writer, is just, he's brilliant. And, and I know I say that about every book we're in, but, you know, when I'm studying a passage, to me, it, I, that passage just becomes all-encompassing in the moment. And uh, Samuel's writer, he uses just this mix of literary devices and these little clues and hints and and there is so much minutia to pick apart that even stories you think you know, if you stop and really look at them and start to kind of get into that nitty gritty detail kind of thing, you begin to see that, oh, wait a minute, there is way more than I've ever heard on any sermon or podcast. And we aren't even going to be able to, to talk about it all. We're just talking about the stuff that entertains me. So, I mean, it, it's it's great. So yeah, we're we're going to be in Samuel for a while. And chapter 16, man, we're going to be there for a long while. Uh, but this week we are in 15. Uh, we're picking up about verse 12. And just to recap for anybody who, who hasn't, uh, you know, might have slept since the last time they listened. This is right after the battle of the Amalekites. Saul has... Um, defeated them but he's also kept some spoils from the war back and samuel is going out to meet him and he's going to tell saul hey you aren't right mm -hmm. i mean that's mm -hmm. what it boils down to and we have this very climactic ending to the 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 story that it is bothersome to a lot of people so we're going to spend some time on that and, and talk about what was going on here should we be bothered by it and you know, what the, the lasting ramifications of Saul's uh, decisions might have been for Israel and really for the world. And because these stories still do impact our lives today. So we, when we left off, Samuel had been up all night crying out to the Lord because he, he's angry. He was angry with Saul for failing. He's angry with Saul for what uh, is going to be required of Samuel at this point. I mean, I think we all know those moments when somebody kind of backs us into a corner and it's like, I don't want to have to do this, but now I'm going to have to. If you've had kids, you've been there. Um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to be the bad guy, but you're forcing me to be the bad guy. And also, I think there, there's this this level of Samuel even questioning himself. Did did he really anoint the right guy? Did he really pick the right king? Did he hear from God? And anybody who's ever had those spiritual moments where you know you've heard God's voice so clearly, and I, I do believe that happens today, that you know you've heard direction and you've had guidance and you act on it and then it all falls apart, the first thing to do is not really to blame God always, but to say, did I hear right? Am, am I on the right path? And so you have to wonder if that didn't you know, kind of shake Samuel's, um, his, his own self-esteem and his sense of identity. So we're going to pick up in verse 12, and we're told that Samuel gets up early in the morning, and he's going out to meet Saul, and he's told that Saul has, has gone to Carmel, and Saul's built this monument there, but now he's going on to um, Gilgal. Right off, we, we, we have a problem, because number one, Saul built a monument, and notice the, the monument is not built to God, it's built for Saul. Now, this, this is not uncommon. Uh, kings did it all the time to a memorial to commemorate a successful battle. But why in the world is he doing that before he goes to Gilgal? So we mm. immediately have this, this mixed up priority that's being shown to us in the person of Saul. And when Samuel finally catches up to Saul in verse 13, Saul comes out and he's like, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I, he, he's trying to sell it. I, mm -hmm. I've done everything. Don't look around. Don't pay attention. Just take my word for it. We're all good. You know, he, Saul is, he is the used car salesman in so many of these episodes. And literally what he says here, if you go back to the Hebrew, he says, I have established Yahweh's words. Now, the brilliance of the writer is on display with this verse. 
because Saul did not establish the words that God told him. Matter of fact, Saul completely ignores what God had told him to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He is establishing Samuel's words, and he doesn't realize how prophetic he's being in this moment. And I, I love how the writer flips that around. Oh, yeah, Saul's right here in this moment, but he doesn't realize what he's right about. And so I, it's, again, that, that the way the writer is so sophisticated, and I think we've been taught so often that the Bible, because it is an ancient book, isn't a sophisticated book. Right. And it really is. And I, I just, because of what we've been studying and because I've been pulling, you know, a lot of things from different sources and I'm getting to see how this really was the height of the writing style at this point in time, it, it, I, 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 I get excited about it because I think we forget that this is not just a spiritual book, but it is a very well written book. And I'm harping on this for a couple of reasons. I think it's become very popular in Christian culture, and I did not mean to go here, so you know, y'all just hang on for the ride. I think it's become uh, very popular in Christian culture just to make do and not to seek excellence. And <laughs> so the fact that the writer of the Bible is using excellence, even in this, I, I think that's a lesson for us. And I think it's one that we need to take to heart because, I mean, we're representing God. So, you know, make, the, may, make use of your TV trays if that's all you've got, but do it well. So anyway, <laughs> didn't anticipate that little tie-in, but it, it's, it worked. <laughs> so yeah. all right, on well, to verse. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. keep going. <laughs> on to verse 14. And Samuel said, what is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? So in Hebrew, and it kind of gets missed in the, in the English, this is a poetic statement. Uh, literally, it, it probably, well, more literally, it, it would read as, then what is the bleeding of small cattle in my ears and the lowing of large cattle that I'm hearing? So you, you have this poetic statement. And when prophets start to speak in poetry, you need to be afraid. That, that's right. just bottom line with, with the Bible. And so... That's all I wanted to point out about that. And Saul, in verse 15, Saul says, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted for destruction. So just note real quick the words there. They have brought the people spared your God. Yeah. Saul's. And, and, and at this yeah. point, are we supposed to think of, of Genesis 3? We are. We are. And it, it's it's very much tied to the story. And, you know, Saul is doing exactly what Adam did and what Eve did. It's it's let me distance myself from the problem. Let me minimize it the best I can. And, you know, he, the, he's shifting the blame for the failure onto the people. Well, when you're king, you don't get to do that. You're responsible for what the king, what the people do. That's the whole point, mm -hmm. is that you are supposed to be leading the people, not letting the people dictate to you what happens, especially if you're a king of Yahweh. And this really is a cover-up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's the same. It, it's, yeah, we, we ate the fruit, but we made us some lettuce clothing. You know, we got some nice salad pants going on. Mm -hmm. But then, Saul, so, you know, we, we, we kept the cattle. But, you know, we're going to kill him. So it's OK. It's fine. You know, don't don't worry about it. it, it it's not a big deal. And th there's so many problems with that because you can't offer a Malachite cattle as a sacrifice to God. Right. Go back to Leviticus 1. Yeah, this has, is this has is, to be from your own flock. Exactly. Exactly. And that's that's the thing. We, we lose that. um we lose that insight if we aren't keeping all of these things in the back of our minds as they should have been in the back of Saul's mind because he should have been taught Torah. That was part of the command for all the people. Back in Deuteronomy, as a nation, everyone should have grown up knowing Torah. So, again, there's a problem because even if Saul hadn't been taught it himself, he should have been teaching it to Jonathan and his other sons and daughters. So he should have known. He He's completely without excuse. And we're going to see that the scripture really wants to put forward Saul is without excuse. So uh, Samuel's response basically boils down to stop talking. J just shut mm -hmm. up. You're, you're digging a big hole for yourself. You, you just need to shut it down. And, you know, he's going to tell Saul what God has said. And he, basically, 
in verses 17 through 19, he, he reminds Saul that without God, Saul is no one. God had given him specific instructions, destroy the sinners and the Amalekites. As a matter of fact, he said to him, fight against them until they are destroyed. So very specific instructions. And instead, Saul has, this is according to Samuel, what Saul has done is pounced on the spoils and did evil in the sight of the Lord. So he's, he's, Samuel isn't buying it. Right. And if you'll notice Saul's excuse, I mean, once again, we go back to these excuses. He just keeps doing it. He, he will not stop running his mouth trying to make it, his sins less. Mm -hmm. And Saul, so verse 20. Saul says to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which God, the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of the Amalek, and I have devoted to destruction. But the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things they devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord, to your God in Gilgal. Again, he's repeating himself. He's not learning anything. Right. <laughs> and I, I think it's kind of interesting that the Bible spends so much time presenting what Saul is doing wrong. I mean, there, there's like absolutely, um, there's too much time spent to it. Right. There, 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 we shouldn't have this many words about the, this particular issue. Well, I mean, it, it, partly I'm guessing they want us to make sure that we know it, it wasn't just a mistake that uh, Saul was being rejected. And, and, you know, it's kind of funny because I mean, and this is just kind of a silly example. You know, it's, uh, I tell my, my kids, you know, I need you to clean the floor. I need you to make sure you pick up mm -hmm. every single thing off of the floor so we can vacuum or, or what have you. And mm -hmm. I come back and, or the oldest came and got me, uh, this just happened a week or two ago. She was, <laughs> she comes back and she goes, I'm, I'm done. The floor's all clean. And I go back in and I... <laughs> I said, are we looking at the same floor? <laughs> because this, there was stuff just still all over it. So, you know, it's like you have to do it all or it doesn't really count. And, and what's, you know, unfortunate is most of the time, whenever I do find the, you know, the task has not been completed. A lot of times I'll come back and I'll find them there. They're drawing a picture and I'm like, you look, now it's not the time for drawing. It's time to clean up the floor. And like, well, I'm making a picture for you. I'm like, but that's not the task right now. <laughs> you that, know? That's exactly, no, that's perfect. That, that is absolutely perfect because that's exactly what's going on here. And, you know, basically Saul saying, hey, I did everything right. I, I did what you asked. I, I, sure, you know, I, I brought the king here and I, I but I killed everyone else. And, mm -hmm. The people brought the animals, not me. It wasn't my fault. And you know, basically, he's trying to redefine the terms. Yeah. And he's saying, I, I know better about how to honor God than God even knows. Because I understand what he wants. Mm -hmm. He may have said this, but he really, you know, he really wants that picture. He, he really <laughs> wants the crayon drawing instead of the floor being cleaned. And, you know, if we as humans can understand what that feels like when it's done to us, now think about what that feels like for God. Right. And, you know, when God, will, you know, 100%, whatever he wants is the right thing, period, because it's what God wants. And, you know, and according to ancient standards, Saul isn't out of line. And I think we need to remember that. This is, this is very normal practice. And we, we've even seen this in uh, Judges, back in Judges 1, where they keep the king alive. And that you keep them as a trophy. We've seen it with Samson, where Samson was displayed in Dagon, mm -hmm. uh, Dagon's temple. So you you have this tradition of when you conquer another nation that you would keep the the, the leading person alive a, as kind of proof that hey, look how great I am. This is how wonderful I am. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, it is an ego booster. And so what he did made total sense if you're going by culture of his day. Now. Again, if we want to talk about uh, about application for today, how many issues do I find Christians and I mean, really great Christians in a lot of ways, but there's always seems to be one issue and I probably have one in my life. And, you know, if I do, I need to address it where we go. Oh, well, yeah, no, today we don't do things that way. It's right. OK. And, and that's not what the Bible says. We have this very clearly laid out. It doesn't matter what your culture says. If God says it's wrong. It's wrong, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, anyway, I will try not to uh, preach too much. But, you know, Saul knows what he's done. And, and you know, we see that because he, he's offered the people up as an excuse. And, and this is, you know, it's, it's their fault. It's the snake's fault. It's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. And, you know, and it's really not that bad because we save the best animals for sacrifice. And the 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 attempt to justify this even by more modern commentators is to say oh well Saul was acting mercifully he spared people he wasn't as mean and vengeful and angry as God he was actually nicer than God okay so there's a problem there but <laughs> let's let's look at, at what Saul did and why it's a problem with Saul um specifically why did he save the king and not the children why is it the king in his camp and not the babies? Well, I, my guess is that it's it's a pride thing because you know we've talked we've talked about the mm -hmm. uh, the the ancient parades where you would come mm -hmm. back with the spoils and you would parade all of the wonderful spoils you got down the middle of your capital and mm -hmm. behind it is the king and what do you do once you get him to the end you get to kill him in front of everyone. Or, yeah. or imprison him or, you know, make him sit at your, on the floor and you're in your courts, you know, something to humiliate him. But, you know, if it was an act of mercy, if sparing lives was an act of mercy, then this king is the one, is the least qualified to receive it. Yeah, it, it should have been the children. It should have been the babies. But then, you know, and then why did he kill the worthless and despised? Why did he keep the best? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If if you're again, if you're going to show the mercy, then it's the ones who need it the most, the ones who 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 have no other recourse and can't uh, seek justice for themselves. And you know, and then Samuel says Saul pounced on the spoil. So he tell he's telling you here, this is not an act of mercy. There's nothing to do with mercy anywhere in it. It has absolutely everything to do with Saul's need to show how great he is and also to gain whatever material you know spoils that he can and i also find it interesting that the scripture never specifically tells us what Saul is planning to do with the king of the, the amalekites well uh, we've I, got some i don't think they necessarily have to say it because that would have been a common thing in the in the culture mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i but i do think that that's what he was wanting i think he was wanting to have a you know that grand parade like who? Mm -hmm. Every other nation. Yeah. You know, and, which is who was, Saul is. Yeah. And he, that's the, yeah, exactly. He is really becoming that person that Israel said they wanted, but they're, mm -hmm. they really are getting to see how, how that's not what they really wanted. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. Cause we kind of, you know, when you look at all the possibilities for why he kept him alive, uh, there, there's really three main pops, possibilities. And if you really kind of just, you know, strip away all the rhetoric and, and look at specifically what they are. We've talked about the one. He's a trophy. Mm -hmm. Look look how great I am. Um, he could have been planning to release him for a ransom. And the way Saul likes spoils of war, that makes sense, too. But, but the who, other... who would he ransom him, and them, him too? I mean, he's killed everyone and, else. Yeah, well, supposedly, maybe. Who knows? He, he was not, he, he seems to have, you know, at least destroyed the, the towns and the villages. But then remember sometimes when we're talking these big biblical stories, all doesn't always mean all, yeah, uh, despite some people who, who will tell you uh, when they're trying to defend certain biblical points from their perspective, all means all. No, it, it it's really hyperbolic speech, hyperbolic speech. So don't yet. Yeah, you've got to take it in context. Um, but the other option is that he really did plan to kill King Agog, but he was going to do it in some kind of ritualized display, which basically would make it a human sacrifice, which is completely forbidden. Sure. You don't get to do that. So no matter which option we choose and say, oh, well, I think it's this or that, none of them are good because none of them are what God told him to do. Right. So... Anyway, verse 22 and 23, uh, Samuel makes his second poetic statement. And I think we're kind of all familiar with this. If you grew up in a um, Southern Baptist home or a homeschooling home, you, you've heard at least Definitely part of this verse this. quoted. <laughs> 
So um, I'm going to read the whole thing and then we're going to kind of pick it apart. And it says, has the Lord as great, as great a delight in the burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. I'm having problems reading today. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So again, songs and poetic utterances by prophets usually indicate the end of something. We see this whenever um, they cross the Red Sea and we have Miriam and Moses singing the, the, the nice bit of poetry there. The prophets of Israel, man, when, they, when Israel is getting ready to go into ex exile, all the prophets are talking in poetry. Yeah. Just go look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. I mean, it's all poetry. But Samuel uses two interesting words. He used hola, which is the, the that's not hello in Spanish. <laughs> uh, it, it's a whole burnt offering. So this is whenever they would take the, the animal and they would basically gut it and skin it. And everything else went on the fire and was completely burned up. The, the, the people don't participate in any of it. So Samuel throws that out there. But then he also throws out Zavak, which is the sacrificial feast. It, it's where you get to participate and you get to eat. And so Samuel's saying, hey, you might say that you brought this back for a sacrifice. But we all know that really what you're doing is this is so y'all guys can enjoy what you took from the from the people. And, you know, your motives, they, they really aren't as pure as just giving something to God. Yeah, well, it's now it's just an excuse so you guys can have a victory party, basically, is what you're saying. Pretty much. And, and typically at these sacrificial feasts, not only were you eating good, you were also drinking good. So it was a giant party. Right. And, uh, you know, I think we forget that in the Bible, hey, they they threw some great parties. But we're going to get back to partying actually towards the end of this chapter again. Uh, well, you so know, you want, to talk about, you want to talk about doing things right. You know, I mean, how many, how much better would this party have been than like, you know, uh, church lock ins or something, you know, that <laughs> just, just the pizza party, you know, where you do things with excellence, bring the beer. I, mean, I guess you can't really you do go. that. I guess you can't really do that with high school students, but you know, maybe the adults. I, it, I don't think it's advisable, uh, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting way off track and I'm totally joking. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, okay. So Samuel identifies uh, the sin as not listening to the voice of the Lord. A, a sacrifice is fine, but if you aren't, it, but if you aren't doing what you were told to do, who cares? God doesn't care. If you're being obedient, it, it doesn't mean anything to him. And then he says, "For rebellion is as divination." Now, this is where things get really interesting. This is where because, this is where things got really interesting to me because I, I want. I'm curious if there's, and I know I'm getting ahead of you. Probably is there a tie <laughs> to this idea and uh, him going to see the witch of Endor later? This is foreshadowing. Okay, this is the idea, and remember we talked about this before. You know, Saul is part of the tribe of Benjamin, and we can look at so many. Of the the members of that family, we talked about on the episode with Jonathan, so many members of that family, uh, Laban, Joseph, uh, Rebecca, sorry, not Rebecca, Rachel, they were all participating in at least things that look like divination. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Joseph and Laban specifically are called an Akash, which is a diviner, yeah. and which is also the, the creature in the garden. And... Uh, well, yeah, this is this. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, I I'm curious about this because the that actually that uh, I know that the the two parts of this that everyone's familiar with, and again, I'm probably getting ahead of your notes, but <laughs> is the uh, to obey is better than to sacrifice. I, I can't tell you how many times I was told that one growing up by various Sunday school and youth group teachers. Um, or rebellion is as witchcraft. Is, rebellion is as witchcraft. That's the one that if you have been in a homeschool family, you have definitely heard that one. Um, you have definitely heard that one. But something I, that occurred and to me. And you know what they did to witches. So. Oh, I know. And uh, so it's like, well, are you going to burn me at the stake? I mean, do we have a stake? Do I have to build one? Like go in and get your own switch? Do I have to? That's neither here nor there. So, so but no, I. Um, you know, because one of the things that I find interesting, because we were, we were uh, you know, listening to Dr. Heiser uh, as he mm -hmm. went through his Leviticus series, he was talking about how the 
idea of of the sacrifices was not to cover sin, um, right? That, that it was to for for holy spaces. Now there there were sacrifices and and reparations you could do for accidental sins, and so right. I. I I was thinking about this, and it's like, well, it kind of makes sense that you would say that the sin of witchcraft uh, or the sin of a rebellion is the same as that of divination, because going and practicing divination, that's not something you're going to necessarily do on accident. It, it's planned no. out. It's methodical, and rebellion is planned. It's as uh, I think, I think uh, it's a sinning with a high hand. Is that the the phrase from the King James? Like to to say you you. Re, you honestly <laughs> you chose specifically to do what god told you not to do and so i think in my mind i'm looking and going okay it makes sense that those two are equal because they are done with this idea of specifically going out of your way to do something you're not supposed to well and i i haven't looked at my king james in so long um you know no one write letters i i love the king james for for what it was in its time it, it has been an excellent resource and tool for centuries if you love it enjoy it have fun with it mm -hmm. um i still like to memorize from it uh because it, it just has that flow yeah and, and that but at the same time I, we do have better bible translations not to get too deep into that but i've been seeing a lot of that going around on facebook so you know let's just throw that out there uh the the omitted verses are not some kind of conspiracy we will talk about that later uh, on a different episode, I'm sure, because that does need to be addressed. But yeah, you 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 brought up um, a really good point about the fact that this this is thought out. This is this is planned. This is deliberate. This is defiance. And, mm -hmm. and really, it it is that search for illicit knowledge. It's saying I can know more from a different source than I can from someone else. And in this case, the source is Saul's own heart. And he, he's trying to figure out what to do based on his own ability and his own wisdom, where if you're the king of Israel, then you don't have that right. Mm -hmm. You don't get to do that. You have to follow God's commands. Now, transfer this to a New Testament setting. We, we are a royal nation, a chosen priesthood. We, we, we are in those roles. So how much does this apply to us that we would actually stop and say okay god's ways are the correct and right ways and that the way the the ways we need to be worshiping him are according to his word not what we think not what we decide is is great for us mm -hmm. that's not enough and so yes the this illicit knowledge isn't always from an outside source sometimes it's us looking inward and you know that's huge in a lot of religions today that you just have to listen to that guiding voice. Look within. Oh, you the, will find it. The answer was inside of you all along. Yeah, all that crap. Um, I edited myself there. You should be happy. Because it's not true. It's a lie. And it's going to lead us astray each and every time. And if you don't see that in Saul's story, you're missing the point. And so the, the idea that, that Saul is, is trying to divine a reason without consulting God this is one of the things that makes him unworthy uh, of being a king. And now this, this statement is, is a Hebraic parallelism. I always say that. It's, there's too many L's in that word. Anyway, it's poetry. So the, 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 for, the second line explains the first line. And so the second line is really interesting because it says, presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. So the, the Hebrew there for presumption, I, mm. I think this is a really interesting word. It means to push or to press. We find it used when um, uh, when Jacob urges Esau to, to accept his gifts. We find it when Lot tries to urge the, or you know, press the angels into staying with him. So it's mm -hmm. the, the idea of causing someone to bend to your will. And so Samuel's saying here, Saul was attempting to make God bend to his will. Well, what do diviners do? Diviners try to, you know, they contact the spirits, they try to get this illicit knowledge, and then they use this illicit knowledge to control the spirits. God will not be controlled. God will not allow Saul to, to bend him to his will. 
because Saul's in rebellion. Now, will God respond to someone who asks with the right heart, seeking to serve him? Absolutely. We find this in other places with Moses, mm-hmm. with Samuel mm-hmm. himself, uh, David. We, we see these points in times where God says, you know, I hear you, but you're coming to me and you're, you're saying, hey, here's my problem. This is, this is why I don't understand or this is what's bothering me about what you said. This is, this is my issue. And so I need to talk to you about it, Lord, and figure out what's going on. Saul didn't do that. He just said, this seems right to me, so this is what I'm going to do. He did what was right in his own eyes, so he's not any better than the judges. Mm-hmm. And so that, that statement there, um, you know, it's not just presuming that he, he, he knew God's will. He was actually actively attempting to manipulate God. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, that's wrong. And I think, again, I know I'm going off. I've been thinking about this passage for weeks and all the well, ways we a, can. There's a lot in it. There's, there's a whole lot in it. Yeah. Well, and especially when you look at today, I mean, how many times do we as Christians, I know it's very popular in certain culture or certain circles of Christianity to pray something in the name of Jesus and think God has to comply. Right. That's well, not how it works. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I, I was thinking about this, you know, the presumption uh, is as iniquity and idolatry. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's to say that, you know, I mean, how many ways can you look at what's going on here? Is, you know, Saul's uh, presuming on God's uh, mercy. He's presuming mm-hmm. that maybe if I do a little, a little extra for God, that he'll make me the king that I should be. You know, it's how many different ways is he going? It's not like going above and beyond. It It is. It's presuming that God just needs more help to see that I can yes. be a better king. And yes. that's not true. Yes. It, well, and, and we see that all the time. I mean, I think it's a human a human tendency that, that we would I you know think that we could somehow know how to serve God better than God knows what he wants. And, and it's. It's not, it's not how it works. And, you know, I, I know one of the huge concepts that finally allowed me to kind of rest in my faith was just simply accepting that God is sovereign. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the fact that God is sovereign, oh my goodness, now I don't have to figure things out. I don't have to worry about, well, what does this mean for so-and-so down the street? Or what does, it, he can take care of that. It's yeah. okay. Well, and, 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 no. and you say you don't have to figure things out. That doesn't mean we're saying don't study, but it, we're saying it means you don't have to um, be in charge of the whole world. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, and good thing for everybody else that we're not. I mean, you know, that, that's the, the beautiful part of it. And especially whenever you, you tie that sovereignty into his love and his grace and his mercy and his justice, because, I, you know, you've got to have all of those things in tension to, to even start to catch a glimpse. Uh, of this this God who is so nuanced. I mean, and okay, another rabbit trail, because when you look at other ancient gods, I mean, they are gods of specific individual things, the God of love, the God of war, the God mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. you know, toad frogs and God of muskrats. Our God encompasses all of that. And so it, it's really hard sometimes to wrap our minds around the totality of who he is. I don't think we're going to do it completely. But to recognize that there are many facets and aspects to his character, he's not just in charge of one thing. Right. And so there we have another reason to be in awe of him. And, I, you know, I don't think we, we recognize that and appreciate that enough because, you know, in our day and age, we only have one God and that God is ourselves. And so, um, you know, we're not that complex or, or awe-inspiring if we want to get really honest. So... You know, I think Saul's story has a lot of implications and ramifications for for today, and mm-hmm. we need to be paying attention to it. So anyway, back to the tax, because we've been meddling in all sorts of business that's not ours. But anyway, <laughs> so um, but he also Samuel points out because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. It was God's word that established Saul as king. And when Saul rejected God's word, he rejected the very thing that made him king. So, you know, that's pretty big that Saul would actually look at this this thing. We're going to call it a thing for lack of a better term. Hmm. This thing that had made him king 
and said, I don't need it. I, I, I don't want it. I'm not going to allow it to define me. And in doing so, he removed all right for him to have the kingship, to be, you know, be on that throne. And so how often do we have this thing that is in our own life that, you know, we're part of God's covenant community. We're part of his family. We're, we're this community of faith. And then we say, oh, well, I, I, I don't need that word. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want that word. And so the very thing that made us who we are in that covenant community and before the eyes of the Lord, it's now been removed. So who are we? We, we we take away our own identity and you know that's kind of scary yep. and so anyway i'll let y'all you know chew on that at home uh verse 24 uh, saul, saul realizes that he's caught and he admits that that he's sinned against god and samuel but he's still blaming the people i feared the people and i obeyed their voice again if you're the king especially the king that god has specifically appointed confirmed that you are the one he's appointed through all these miraculous acts. Remember back to Saul's anointing. He, he knows how God works. He has prophesied under the spirit of the Lord. Right. The, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And he's still more afraid of the people than God. Again, mixed up priorities. So, so verse 25, Saul asked Samuel to forgive him. Not God, Samuel. I think that's an interesting point. But he asked for Samuel to return with him so that they can bow before the Lord. And so basically he's saying, hey, help me look good in front of the crowds. Mm -hmm. Don't let the people know that God has rejected me. And, you know, he he says, come back with me. Let me show my devotion in front of the people so to bow before the Lord. His explicit command or request of Samuel has nothing to do with being restored to God's presence, to, to experience God's mercy. It's all about image. And there's been some similarity noted that if you go back and read Exodus 10, uh, verses 16 and 17, Pharaoh does the same thing. Pharaoh does the same thing with Moses. And he, he's like, you know, go, go ask your God to forgive me. You know, will you forgive me? He asked Moses if you can forgive me. Uh, he admits that he's wronged God and Moses. And he pleads with Moses to pray on his behalf so that, that he can survive. And so that's when God stops the plague of locust. And Pharaoh absolutely does not pay attention because we know, you know, this is, I think there's four more plagues after that one. Mm-hmm. And now Zamora thinks that this is kind of forced, but I think it kind of explains why Samuel wouldn't accompany Saul at this point. He's saying, mm, I don't want any part of it. I, I, you aren't obeying God. I obey God what what do we have in common and so you know samuel just reminds saul in verse 26 hey you've been rejected you rejected god so you've been rejected mm-hmm. and samuel starts to walk away and saul grabs his robe and the robe tears and the hebrew is very specific it's the corner of the robe now, if you go back to Numbers 15, 37 through 39, we find that one of the requirements of the Jewish people was to, to wear these robes that had tassels on the corners. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Bible doesn't say it, but traditionally these tassels are made up of 613 threads. One of them is a blue thread. And the, the idea was that when they would see these tassels, they would remember that their lives are to be defined by their obedience to God mm-hmm. and that God is the one who, who establishes who they are as a covenant community. And so it, it, it's really, it's interesting that this is the part that, that Saul grabs hold of and he tears and man, Samuel, he jumps on this as an object lesson. He turns this event into a prophetic act. And he says in verse 28, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day. Th- this day, that, that's significant. Before this, you had a chance. Mm-hmm. Right now, as of, as of right now, you, you don't have any chance at all. And just like you ripped the, the law from me as a prophet, attempted to rip the law from me as a prophet, God's going to turn it back around on you. That, that you are going to be ripped out of this kingdom. And 
it's it's a very graphic demonstration of what is going on in the spiritual realm. It's being recreated in the physical realm. But this also connects us to Mark 5. And the contrast is, is, is amazing. Now, it, it, you probably already know which story I'm getting ready to go into. but I think so. You're, you're going to have to refresh <laughs> me. I, I, I'm terrible with knowing by numbers, you know, reference numbers and I, stuff. So if you tell me yeah, like, the, what the story entails, I, I'm sure I know which one it is. Oh, yeah. You know the story. I, I'm bad with numbers, too. I can't find anything in a Bible that's not my own. Uh, it's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Oh, and okay. she, she goes through the crowd. She's unclean, which is total violation of the law. You, you don't do that. So she's touching people. She's making them unclean. And the fact that she's touching them, she's pressing into Jesus and she grabs the corner of the robe, that place where those tassels would have been. But the difference is, and this is it's just beautiful, because by grabbing onto that, it's basically a prophetic act in and of itself that says, I'm grabbing onto the promises of God's word, the 613 laws contained in the Torah. I'm grabbing it not to rip it from Jesus, but so that he will turn and see me. Mm -hmm. Now, what a contrast. It's the same act, it's, it, but the, the heart is different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the outcome is different because what happens with her? She's restored. She, she is completely, and not, she's not just healed of an issue of blood. And I think this is one thing we forget. She didn't just have this physical ailment, you know, taken away from her. She was returned to her family. Yeah. She was returned to her community. And that's, that's huge. And so it, it well, I mean, you, because you think about it, you, there was during that time, she couldn't prepare food. She couldn't take care of the kids. She could nothing. Couldn't I mean, be she with could, her husband. She couldn't even serve her family. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so to to be restored to your your to your personal little kingdom. And I'm not trying and I want to clarify, I'm not trying to say that that's like her only <laughs> to serve her family is the right. only thing. But whenever I mean, I know whenever I can't do anything to help my family out, I start to feel yeah. a little useless. You know, if I get sick for a few days mm -hmm. and I can't do anything but sit on the couch. I feel a little useless and I feel terrible that I'm not able to help. So that's, that was, I just want to Right, it's not a gender like, specific. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, so I wanted to clarify, I'm not trying to say, oh, well, if you can't serve your family, you're worthless as a, as a, as yeah. a woman, because I don't think that's true at all. No. I mean, that's. No, and that, and, but that's the, the point is that it, she couldn't be a part of the community, no matter what role she played or what she specifically did. It, it was that was taken away from her in that condition. And so you had this total reversal mm -hmm. uh, of Saul's story within her story. And it's also interesting that later on, when David has the chance to kill Saul, he cuts off the corner of the robe. And so we're, we're going to, we'll talk more about that when we get to David's story. But this, this corner of the robe is a significant symbol in the biblical narrative because of what's on the corner. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that context, then you aren't catching all of that. I always just thought, you know, okay, she grabbed the, the hem of Jesus garment and didn't think that much about it. Now, when you realize what she's grabbing onto specifically, now you have this, this fuller picture of what's going on. Uh, and I, I think these are important things to know. Um, uh, and it's also important to, to recognize clothing in general just plays a significant role within the book of Samuel itself. You know, we started out, what, what's Hannah doing? Every year she goes back to, to the, the Shiloh, she, she takes Samuel clothing. Uh, we, we talk about Samuel's robe and we talk about Saul's robe in several stories. We, and we talk about how the messenger, messengers are clothed. And... Mm -hmm. and Probably the most graphic and, and heartbreaking use of the clothing symbolism is when we get to the story of Tamar and when she tears her clothing after her brother had raped her. So, it, you know, pay attention to clothing. Uh, another side note, I got to go there. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's this whole thing uh, in our society now that people can't tell me what to wear. It's my body. I get to wear whatever I want. If it causes you problems, it's on you. Uh, yes. I agree with that. 
to a point. The, the other side of that coin is that we have to recognize clothing has always communicated a message. It, it tells us something. This is why we have uniforms. Mm-hmm. This is why we, we have, you know, black for funerals, white for weddings, because we as a society and culture, as a human race, since the dawn of time, have known that clothing communicates a message. So do you have the right to wear anything you want? Absolutely. But know that you're sending a message. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, anyway, verse 27, this is the last part of that verse. Samuel says, God has given it to a neighbor. You know, you, the kingdoms are ripped from, your, from you, but it's being given to a neighbor who is better than you. Mm-hmm. Now, no name is given. Samuel doesn't even know who it is at this point. But this, this made me stop and think for a moment. Because we all know it's David. There is no surprise for us. David is not presented very favorably in the book of Samuel at all. It's right. actually very critical of it, of David. How bad is Saul? What, what are we not grasping about this man if David's better? Hmm. I, I hadn't considered that, but that's a pretty <laughs> interesting point. Yeah, I don't have an answer. I mean, but I, I think it, it would... Well, you're supposed it, to. That's what we're here for, right? <laughs> sorry, you're out of luck. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. Um, I'm sorry. Go on with no, what you're saying. No, I think it makes a good lens, though, to to read the rest of the book through. And so I think it's going to answer some... I think some of that is going to... Some of the answer for that's going to come out as we go along. That's the words I'm looking for. Sure. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Samuel goes on and he says, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret for he is not man that he should have regret. Uh, this, this glory of in Israel or splendor of Israel, both translations are correct. I, I love it. Samuel creates a new title for God on the spot. And, yeah, you know, the question of regret and lying we we addressed in a previous episode, I think pretty well. But I, I just want to point out that this this verse is kind of at odds with what happened before because Samuel says God does regret mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and God does grieve, and so I want to point out you know, that there's a difference between having an emotion over what is happening within the relationship versus what you're doing as an official role, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think uh, I've been watching some political shows, uh, like fiction shows, because politics today just depresses me. But anyway, uh, you know, when you have these presentations of like the president of the United States and there's this enemy and he's having to decide whether to bomb this place or not, and, you know, it's OK for him to grieve over the loss of life as a human being, as a person, an individual. As the president and responsible for defending our, our home nation and uh, the people of this of this country, he can't afford to have that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think we're looking at two very different roles within God. And guess what? God's allowed. He's infinite. He can have all of these. So is this an absolute final statement? I don't think so. But I also this morning, I mean, just this morning, so this is a half form thought. Um. I want to go back and check the Hebrew because I I wonder if the statement isn't more, who are you as a human being to cause an infinite God to feel this way? Right. You don't have the right to to make him feel this way. And you should be ashamed for making him feel this way. Mm -hmm. And so I I, I don't know if that's a valid reading or not. Uh, Like I said, I, I just thought of it like five minutes before we started recording. Right. So, uh, no, I mean, uh, it would make sense. Um, I think we kind of touched on this last week um, when we were talking about the difference between those and that possibly one of them is that, you know, I, I have re- I have experienced regret for my decision, but I don't have to keep it is kind of yeah. a, one of the aspects of it. Yeah, it definitely does not have to. um definitely does not have to be something that God entertains or, or nurses like, w- like we often do. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is really an, an official statement. Uh, this is the final prophetic decree concerning Saul's reign. And at this point, when you get that sovereign proclamation, 
it's done. Th- mm-hmm. These, this is the point where it, it it is over, and no amount of human begging or pleading or repentance is going to change anything because Saul's been given chance after chance after chance, and that's what we find in Scripture. And I think we even see this, like with the angels. And I, there's this this I did not even mean to go here. Uh, yeah, you know, there's this this thing that's going on in some Christian circles now that angels who have fallen should you know we should pray for them and try to help them reconcile with God. If a divine, holy, spiritual, powerful being has stood in the presence of God, in the presence of God, witnessed who and what He is, and they still chose to rebel against Him. Then, then they close the door, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Saul ha- he's had similar, similar experiences, and so you know I think this is one of the reason why there, there's some really harsh verses written in the New Testament pertaining to people who have believed and experienced God and then fallen away. So, you know, once you've experienced that with God, what, what's going to convince you to to repent? What's going to convince you to change your life? If you if what love and grace he has shown you up to this point isn't enough then then what is and Saul this is the position where Saul is at so anyway verse 30 he says then I have sinned yet honor me now before the elders of the people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God so so finally you know he's being honest this is what I want I, I just want my image maintained I, I, yeah, I screwed up. I, I sinned. I admit it. But, you know, don't let me look bad in front of everyone else. And I'll bow before your God, before Samuel's God. Notice it's not his God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, verse 31, Samuel goes back with Saul and Saul does bow before the Lord. And at first, this is puzzling because, you know, why would Samuel change his mind when he seems so adamantly against it to begin with? I think think something clicked for Samuel and he realized that he needed to get into position for what's coming next because what happens next is kind of mind-boggling verse 32 then Samuel said bring here to me Agag the king of the Amalekites and Agag came to him cheerfully Agag said surely the bitterness of death is past this verse is really difficult the Hebrew is very vague Septuagint is a much more help because how Agag approached is really under dispute. Uh, did he come cheerfully as the ESV has it? Did he come haltingly? Did he come in chains? The, the Hebrew actually, that's how it reads. Did he come daintily? Um, and, and Agag's statement itself has a couple of different ways of being read. It just depends on where you put the inflection. And of course, you mm-hmm. know, this is written text, so we don't get that. So one way is he could have been relieved thinking that since he's being brought before the prophet, not the executioner, ex- executioner surely the uh, bitterness of death is past. Oh, I'm, I'm so relieved. Everything's great. Or he could be fearful of the holy man. Um, and so a, a a valid translation there would is would the bitterness of death be thus? Is, is this the guy who's going to do me in? Is this my my fate? Or he knows he's going to die. Surely this is the bitterness of death. Or or or, or is it I've made my peace with it? That's the final option. He knows that he's destroyed Saul. He 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 has completely ruined Saul's reign. So well I. I, I well, I, I think there, I think there's I think there's another option, not so much that he's ruined Saul's reign, because you know that's still probably kind of inside information <laughs> between Samuel and Saul at this point. But what my thought would be that the bitterness of death has passed. You know, the guys just watched his entire kingdom get destroyed, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he's just saying, "I don't have anything else to live for." It could be, it could be, and that's the thing we we don't know, and and I think all of these there's a possibility. And, you know, when I come up across a, a scripture like that, where there, there's like no definitive guideline on, on what the absolute final translation should be, <clears throat> or even what the Hebrew says, then I think it's okay to, to entertain all of the possibilities and, and to consider each one 
and what can you gain out of them? I don't think anyone has to be excluded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. So yeah. I, I, well, and and the, what I tend to do, and this may this may be a, a a completely wrong way of going about it, is I I mean it's true. I just this is just what I tend to do whenever I come across these because that it seems to me you know that. I don't want to, cl- I want, I don't want to close the door on all the options. I want to like keep them all as a possibility, especially mm-hmm. when there's not any specific direction. But then I like to take it and go, which one seems like the most visceral reaction or the most human <laughs> right? way of, of, of thinking about this? Because again, we're dealing with real people in real situations. So that's, um, that's one of the things that I do. And I, I think it would be like the the bitterness of death has passed as in like seeing my kingdom get destroyed was so much worse than than my execution could ever be. Um, I, so that actually I don't I don't think that's bad criteria actually. I think that's actually pretty good criteria um because you know one of the tendencies that we we have with the scripture is how to make it more holy. How to make the characters more holy? How how do we you know separate them from from humanity? And so, I I can actually see where that would be helpful. So, um, verse thirty three, <clears throat> Samuel says, "As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women." And then Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. This is the the final poetic statement uh, of this chapter. And in this moment, Samuel takes his place as a judge. Uh, He has directly confronted an enemy of the Lord, and he has prevailed. Mm -hmm. And he has completed the task that Saul the king should have done. And so we are given this one final moment where we see the judges are superior to the king Mm -hmm. and samuel pronounces the reason that agag has been condemned to die he has made women childless Mm -hmm. he's been killing children this is why he cannot survive he's not just a king over wicked people he's a king who has actively participated in the wickedness of his Mm -hmm. nation Mm -hmm. and in the torah one of the most egregious things you can do is to dishonor that bond between a mother and a child. This is the reason why dairy and meat products are kept separate. You don't use the what was supposed to nourish nourish like a calf or a goat in its destruction. Right. And so it's to remind you that that bond is sacred. And then, you, of course, we have the command in Deuteronomy with when you gather eggs, send the mother bird away. You You should not... Um, allow the mother bird to see the destruction of her children. Right. So even in these little things, we're 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 being reminded that God has a great care and compassion for this relationship. And I, I think sometimes you know we we just think that the the Jewish dietary laws are really weird, and we don't realize the beauty that God is being um, you know God's presenting to us. So. Verses 34 and 35, Samuel goes back to Ramah. Uh, Saul goes back to Gibeah. Now, this is pretty much the last time they interact. There's one other time that there is an interaction, but how um, how connected and how engaged they are with each other in that interaction is kind of up for debate. But we, we've learned that Samuel, even now, still grieves over Saul. But... Um, Real quick, I know we're going to go over just a touch, but that, I, that's I think, fine. yeah, I think everybody will be good with it because this is really interesting. Now, this sparing of Agag, keeping him alive, traditionally, note the word there, traditionally, this is not part of the biblical text. It is something that's outside that helps us understand the Bible more clearly. It may or may not be true, but it is an interesting thought to um, to entertain and. So this is what connects us to the book of Esther. And if you look in Esther, there's this guy named Haman the Agite. Mm -hmm. He is a descendant of Agag, whether it's this particular Agag or another Agag, we don't know. But the tradition says that during this time, 
that Saul spared him, that he actually fathered a child. And these children wound up in Persia. And when they wound up in Persia, one of these descendants, Haman, uh, became the um, the evil person who attempted to destroy the, the Jews. And so this, this disobedience is of Saul here in Samuel is actually believed to have ramifications centuries later. Wow. And so it, it's supposed to, to remind you that the little decisions you make today will impact not just your life, they're going to impact everyone. And we, we see in Haman not just the, the name there, which is, is significant. We also see you know, the desire for power, the willingness to take advantage of the powerless, and the, being willing to attack the powerless, which is part of the Amalekites' MO from the beginning. We get that all the way back in the Torah. And so the, the tradition here is born out of Saul's sin. And not only did it impact Esther in, in Judaism, it's still believed to be impacting the world today. Now, the way they address that, and I, I think this is beautiful, they, they say that all of us have a little bit of Agag in us, that all of us have this element of evil in us. And it's our job to kill it, just like Samuel killed the king in front of Saul. Hmm. And so, you know, let's put that in Christian terms. We have to conquer our flesh. Right. We're, we're responsible for being as ruthless with our flesh as Samuel was with this enemy of the Lord, because th- this enemy didn't possess the, the capacity for compassion or mercy right. or honor. And so when we confront that in ourselves, uh, are, we, are we Saul inviting it to a celebratory feast? Or are we Samuel and saying, you don't belong here. You're not part of this covenant community and you don't get to participate. Right. And so this is this story. It it just explodes with with possibilities for how we can actually bring it into our lives. And for that reason, I love it. So very cool. Well, was there anything else on that thought or we... uh... I think that's going to wrap us up for now. And, okay. you know, I'm out of coffee, so that means we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Fair <laughs> so. enough. So, uh, yeah, well, that's, well, I mean, seems like a reasonable place to break. And uh, next week we're going to come back with uh, King David or David oh, anointed yeah. king. Um, Finally get to meet him. Yeah. So the plot gets really thick here very quickly. <laughs> and, um, I mean, if it's not good enough, I mean, just keeps unfolding. And, yeah. But this this is, I mean, I would love to see someone actually do an accurate movie about this stuff because I do think it would be better right? than, than or, or series even probably that I, I think a series would be better, you know, because well, we're kind of in the, the, air, the era of series. So, well, you get to explore characters better with a series and maybe, you know, after the guys who are doing The Chosen get done with that series, maybe they'll pick this up because uh, not affiliated with that, that show, but it's worth mentioning. Mm hmm. If you have not watched The Chosen, uh, it's an app. You have to look it up. You just Google it. The Chosen. Great, great series uh, as far as presenting Jesus. And, and what I loved about this series is Jesus is human. I, and I'm not saying that at the discount or the disparity of, of his divinity, but to recognize that, you know, he had human relationships. He mm-hmm. had a sense mm-hmm. of humor. He he had compassion. He grieved over the people that hurt in front, you know, those who were right there in front of him. And this is the Jesus that you want to know, yeah. that you want to be in your life. And so is it perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, there, there's some things that, you know, we take issue with, but they're small things. And sure. if it, if it pa- causes you to pause and really think about what it would be like to be in his presence, then I think they have achieve their goal so yeah maybe we can get them to do david at some point yeah so. well sounds good well hey everyone uh thanks for joining us i hope you enjoyed being here with us i think uh this was a real fun interesting show um so we'll be back next week um in the meantime hit us up on uh facebook twitter instagram raven creek sc uh go to raven creek sc.com where you can get in contact us contact with us also check out the other shows uh change my mind with luke t harrington and the commentarians with joe zaragoza and sometimes me and emily um just depending on which month it is and who is who's got the the time to do it yes so um thanks again and we will see you next week have a good one bye bye 
Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.